Hello everyone, this is Tony Abad. Welcome to another episode of The Digital Diplomat. And today, we are going to ask that enduring question of what do we do when East meets West? We have with us uh, a dear friend of TCP Growth, uh, one of our guest speakers and advisors. Um, he is, interestingly, a certified cultural intelligence quotient facilitator, or uh, he's an expert in CQ, which I'm going to ask him about. A partner at Oliver White, uh, Asia Pacific, uh, and now uh, coming to us from Melbourne, Australia, we have a good friend, Peter Metcalf. Peter, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Tony. Thanks for having me here today. Great to be here. Before I, I, I ask you, uh, you know, our, our few our few chosen questions, I wanted to ask you a little more background about uh, what you've been up to. Uh, I know you've been in Hong Kong uh, for some time, and then you moved uh, moved to uh, to Melbourne, where yes. you are now, and you are specializing in this very interesting concept uh, of cultural intelligence quotient facilitating and consulting. Yeah, Tony. Well, I'm, I've, the last 12 years uh, in Hong Kong, I've been uh, working in my management consulting practice uh, where we help organizations, uh, whether they be multinational companies or whether they be local indigenous companies to improve their business performance. And we do that by helping them to uh, improve their planning and connect all elements of the organization. And you can imagine in big multinationals, it's not just one office we're talking about. It's a global office, a regional office, and then often many, many multiple local offices in countries. And so having come out of a, uh, a Western background, I'm, I'm British uh, and spent most of my working career in Australia, moving to Hong Kong for me was, was an exciting move, but quite a cultural shock at the same time. Mm. Uh, and the more I worked with these multinationals with different cultures, uh, I realized that uh, applying a one-size-fits-all model to, uh, to, to helping these organizations wasn't going to work. And so, and so this concept of uh, cultural intelligence or CQ uh, was brought to my attention. And uh, I spent the last three years, and I wish I'd spent the last 30 years, but I spent the last three years studying different cultures and understanding the different nuances of them and uh, and using that knowledge to to help my customers to to communicate better and deliver better performance. And then you have this other concept, uh, which is rather rather new as well, which is HQ. And uh, it's interesting because you're, you're you're emphasizing that well, we're all humans, so H, human intelligence quotient. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I can. It's just uh, <clears throat> it's just one of my wild ideas that. Uh, came up one day. I mean, we we all know generally about IQ or the intelligence quotient. And it was many years ago that I did an IQ test and I scored very highly and you feel pretty good about it. But then along came another concept called EQ. So the emotional side of things and how do we how do we deal with people and, and help them get through good times and bad times and uh, um, and build better relationships. And then of course I got introduced to this concept called CQ. So cultural quotient or the cultural intelligence. And I'm thinking all along the way, and when you hear about disputes that go on in the world and the and the uh, fractious sort of nature of geopolitical environments and then and then and then even within companies, the multicultural differences, I'm I sort of synthesize it all back down to say, well, we're all human, aren't we? After mm. all, we all want the same things in life generally. Um, so if we bundled IQ and EQ and CQ together, then what would that equal? Well, that would equal how to be a better human. And so how to be a better human, and I haven't written the book, written the book on this yet, but how to be a better human, I think would be scored in the context of this, this, uh, hypothetical concept called HQ or the human quotient. And, and I was just reading a book, uh, Recently, I got a, an advanced copy from a, a Dr. David Livermore, who's who, who's one of the founders of the Cultural Intelligence Center, who actually taught me how to be more culturally intelligent. And he's written a new book. And in that book, uh, in the in the early pages, he talks about 
human beings around the world, the uh, research that has been done says that I think it's 99.5% of all humans share the same DNA. Yes. So it's only 0.5% that makes us different. But it's that 0.5% <laughs> that, that, is, that is really challenging for us as human beings to actually uh, master and to understand. And so if we're all 99.5% the same, why can't we get the 0.5% right? So if we can combine intelligence and emotion and culture together, then presumably we'll all be better people and we'll have a better world. The 0.5% has been the cause of uh, much of the, you know, the tragedy and, 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 yes. violence and, and conflict uh, these past centuries. And we actually have more in common than we have different from each other. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So why wouldn't we apply that to our, day-to-day -day dealings with people, be it within our own families, within our own businesses, within our own communities or across across uh, countries and, you know, into the global stage. All right. Well, then speaking of, uh, you know, your specialization, uh, CQ, what makes dealing with Asian clients uh, nowadays uh, a very important skill for a business leader or a consultant uh, or advisor coming from a Western background? Yeah, good question, Tony. I, I, uh, I was looking at some statistics earlier and uh, I think it's something like 7 trillion US dollars uh, or even more now probably uh, comes out of Asia every year in terms of exports, goods supplied to the rest of the world. So there's obviously people within the West and it's predominantly the US and Europe that are actually consuming these exports. So there's obviously a strong interest in, uh, for a business person to be to be working with Asian organisations uh, because that's where they're sourcing uh, a lot of their product from, and we've we've seen it in the last couple of years, haven't we, with COVID, that uh, we've heard more about the supply chain. I think in the last two and a half years than a person like you with your legal background has probably ever heard. There's always something wrong with the supply chain. You know, this this supplier can't supply this component. So therefore we can't make this product and we can't then send it on to someone else. And so so the whole global network of demand and supply, a lot of it is tied up within Asia. And we've become very reliant on that, you know, the semiconductor industry, et cetera. So there's so many examples of it. So if a Western leader and a Western business person doesn't have a clear understanding about Asian culture, well the then they're in trouble. So you'd have to you'd have to assume that there are a, a, a reasonable percentage of Western people out there that do understand Asian culture. Otherwise, they wouldn't be generating that level of exports. But in my experience, working with multinational companies, the percentage of people within the organisations, Western organisations, don't have the skill set to be able to effectively and efficiently deal with. Uh, people from Asian uh, communities because because they don't take the time to fully understand just what the nuances are of their particular cultures. And then based on your your own personal experience, uh, Peter, could you could you share with us maybe a, a story or two about well where where a Western business leader has either failed to uh, <laughs> you know to uh, to understand Asian culture or actually succeeded uh, and was able to, you know, sort of bridge that gap? I can start with uh, a, a leader that was frustrated, but then eventually uh, removed that frustration through through his ability and through our coaching to uh, to talk um, more effectively with with the, his counterparts in Asia. So so uh, this particular CEO uh, had a had a managing director in China who who he was very frustrated with because because every time the Chinese person told him that he would deliver a particular result, he didn't deliver that result. Mm. And so, you know, most organizations have an annual budget. And so the Chinese leader had said, we will deliver that budget. And of course, for those of you who dig deeper into the Chinese culture and generally across Asia, there's this concept of keeping face. Uh, and so, of course, once once that leader had made that commitment, he was... He was uh, uh, well well set in his mind that he would deliver that. Chinese leaders uh, are particularly um, autocratic, so they so they make the decision 
and they push the uh, push the uh, the direction down through the organisation because they feel that's the most effective way to run the business. So this person had made the promise. Month after month, he wasn't delivering against the promise. When the when the leader in the, in in the US asked for the update, he would continually to say, "Don't worry, I will get the budget. I will hit the budget." And of course, over the months, the uh, the a US leader was was seeing that this this isn't going to work. I need to I need to get the truth out of this person, but I'm having difficulty getting the truth out of him. Uh, and we stepped in and said, well, the only way you can get the truth out of this person is if you have a very close relationship with mm -hmm. this person. So it's not just a transactional discussion of, hey, I'm the boss here in, in uh, America uh, and you're my boss in China. Give me this monthly report and tell me, tell me what you're doing right and tell me what you're doing wrong. That's very transactional. It's about getting to know the person better, spending more time with them, Building, building a relationship, building trust. And so it took this executive a number of attempts uh, and they had to be face-to-face -face attempts. Mm -hmm. So he had to spend more time in, in, in China and Shanghai, as it turned out to be, working closely with this local leader to, to build a better relationship, understand him more personally as well as business-wise, uh, and also encouraging him to say it's okay to tell the truth. It's okay to tell me if you don't think that I'm going to deliver the result, because because in a, uh, in the US, you know the practice that they that, that they tend to uh, encourage is that uh, bad news early is better than bad news late. So let's expose any issues we have and let's talk about it and let's work collectively to try and uh, address it. But uh, but in the case of China, it's I've made the promise and I'm going to deliver the promise. So it's very black and white. So, yeah. so we had to spend some time working closely with this Chinese leader. And it didn't, you know, it took six months or more to build up that relationship until it got to the stage where over dinner, he was able to finally <laughs> declare that he was struggling. And of course, it's not a business meeting in an office. It's, it's, it's a dinner, maybe, maybe having had a few glasses of Baijiu or something like that. But anyway, that's, uh, that's where the, that's where the, that's where the trust finally came in that, you know, I'm confident that I can trust you if I tell you the truth that I won't get into trouble uh, because there was a fear of failure there as well. It reminds me of this term, Huang Xi. You know, they have to... Yes, exactly. They have to develop this relationship. Uh, yes. And like you said, maybe over a few cups of Mo Tai, you know. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. And yeah. just, um, was it 95% on talking about everything else except the, <laughs> that yeah, five exactly. topic, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just talking about normal things in life, isn't it? And, you know, the, the conversation doesn't have to be 95% about business when, right. you, when you're having dinner. It's okay. it's about everything else that goes on in your life. And just once again, it's that it's a bit of that emotional intelligence. I don't know whether the Chinese use the term EQ, but I I tend to find that they are probably more emotionally attached than than the western people and at the end of the day it's hq as well as yeah know. exactly <laughs> yes yes it's pulling all the bits in because generally speaking and that's one of the one of the things that i learned when i when i was studying cq is that uh, you know having having technical experience doesn't doesn't mean you've got cultural intelligence having strong functional uh, experience doesn't mean you've got uh, cultural intelligence living in a country doesn't mean you've got cultural intelligence. So even even if that CEO planted himself in China, it doesn't necessarily mean that he or she has CQ. I'm glad that uh, that story finally had the happy ending, and I yes. <laughs> hope the CEO is doing well now uh, with his yes. director. Now you know, uh, Peter. Something I, I I study are 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 these trade agreements that are being forged uh, that tend to break down the barriers, you know, whether it's bureaucratic barriers or regulatory barriers uh, to trade and investment. And you've pointed out that uh, we have, you know, so many trillion dollars worth of, of, of trade and investment going back and forth between Asia and the US and the EU. Uh, now you have uh, uh, agreements like RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is going to be the biggest agreement between you know coming all the way from china down to new zealand uh then you have yeah, yeah. the uh, trans-pacific partnership you know which goes the other way it's horizontal yes. 
So you're going to see a lot more of the interaction. I think what I'd like to ask you before, uh, before we end is really, uh, what is your word of advice or, uh, or even, you know, a number of tips that you would give uh, a budding Western background business leader or an entrepreneur, somebody who's aspiring to, to do business with, with China, with India, you know, with Southeast Asia, uh, yeah. using, you know, what you just shared with us about, about CQ, HQ, understanding the Asian mindset. Yes, yeah. Well, the analogy here will be uh, physical, Tony. Mm -hmm. So it's to do with your head. You've got two ears and you've got one mouth. So use them in that ratio. So as a Western person coming into Asia, whether it's your first time or whether it's your 10th time or your 100th time, you're still learning. And you can only learn if you ask questions uh, and you listen to people. Uh, and in my experience, uh, and I've done it myself countless times, I've come into Asia with this belief that they need to learn from me. Mm. So I need to tell them things. So I've got to use my mouth. I've got to talk and talk and talk and tell them and tell them. And then, and then, and then you finally f find out that as you're asking them questions, you find that they know what you're talking about and they're wondering why you're telling them things that they already know about, but because of their nature, they don't want to challenge you because I'm the senior guy, I'm seen as a professor or whatever. But th the same rule applies to any any Western person coming in. Don't think you know it all because there's some very intelligent people in Asia. They know what they're doing. They run very successful businesses. So be inquisitive. Ask questions, learn, learn, learn. Learn about their different cultural values and in learning those cultural values, then take that knowledge and apply it to your business dealings to try and strike the right level of service level agreement or trade agreement with that particular customer. Communication, diplomacy, <laughs> that's the that's the name of the game, I think. And then we then I think we would we would avoid a lot of the the problems that come up and the sort of things that you deal with with trade disputes if we'd bothered to to have a conversation and find out the differences between our cultures to be able to uh, uh, head them off at the past, be proactive to avoid the issues before they become serious. And one of those, one of those key elements of doing business with, with Asians is that, uh, is that relationship building, you know, and going out for dinner, going out for lunch, right. having breakfast with them, meeting them in a, in a uh, neutral environment where you can get to know them. You can't do that in the digital world. So it does make it more complicated. We'll keep all of this in mind. And uh, I know earlier we, uh, we uh, already asked uh, that you join us again sometime in the, <laughs> yes. in the near future. So it's yeah, nice, I would to, love to. nice to have you back. Uh, it will be nice to have you back. And thank you so much for, uh, you know, it's a, our conversations are always too short here, but uh, they're always meaningful. And uh, Peter, you've, uh, you've given us a lot of uh, good advice. If our viewers, our audience likes what they've been hearing and uh, interested in what we've been uh, talking about, and then please follow us uh, on all our social media, TCP Growth, The Digital Diplomat. Peter, thank you again. And uh, you. audience, thank you. And we'll see you again next time.